And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. <laughs> Well, hello to everyone watching the Weighing In Podcast. We are lucky enough to have a man that is incredibly talented in so many areas that pisses me off. He was an incredible fighter. He had an incredible ability to cut you open with elbows. He is the voice of BattleBots. He has done the UFC as a commentator, the PFL. He is the man, the myth, the legend. He is known as Ken Flo. Kenny Florian, how you doing? Why are you laughing? Well, that it's is also so, true. What an introduction. Uh, I, I'll pay you back, Big John. My goodness. All right, baby. I'll give you All the right. money back. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Very kind. Good to see you guys. Good brother. to see you, brother. It's so good to see, man. I've been trying, I've been chomping at the bit to get you on for so long, man. I mean, there's so much history with the, not just you and I, but just history in terms of the sport that you carry with you, man. And, uh, Thank you. man, I'm just all the way from the, for, for one of the first times I ever saw you, I think I even met you around that time too, was the ultimate fighter, yes. you know, and just living in the house and the fights being, you, you know, obviously you went way down in weight since the ultimate fighter starting. Yeah. Right? No, you, you went can... way up in weight to get out. I went that. way oh, up and then way back yeah, down. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, I mean, like, look, I guess to start off, let's start off in the beginning there with the Ultimate Fighter. Mm -hmm. How much did it suck living in the house with all those knuckleheads? Like, <laughs> you know what's <laughs> funny is like looking back, like after the experience, I would never have done it again. But I think yeah. I went in there with such ignorance you know and they say ignorance is bliss <laughs> where i didn't know what was what so i just kind of had a smile on my face i'm like this is an experiment and i kind of knew that going into it yeah. so i was ready to be the guinea pig and just see what happens and i also had such little mma experience where i didn't know what was normal what was right you know what i mean like i was just like yeah. all right let's do this let's just see what happens and um you know it worked out okay it was it was good and then it was bad and then i was like wait a sec i, I think i actually want to want to do this because even prior to that experience i i wasn't necessarily sure or definitely didn't have it in my mind that i wanted to be a pro fighter at that point yeah. i just kind of wanted to have some experience as a fighter and just say that i did it and kind of conquer that fear and 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 accumulate some skills but uh, it really wasn't until i got my butt kicked by diego sanchez that i was like all right, I can't go out like that. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, but then the weight classes, obviously, back then, were, it was 185 and 205. Was, am I correct, right? It, exactly. For, yeah. for, the, for the, yeah. the first ultimate fighter. Yeah, for the fighter, first ultimate yes. fighter. Because I remember, like, you know, obviously a lot of guys ended up jumping way down and weight after, you know, Koshik was at 70. I know, yes. Fitch was actually Swick. at the airport. Swick was at yeah. 205. Yeah, he was at 205. Yeah, exactly. But Fitch, Fitch was actually at the airport and got a call from the UFC and took him off the show. Wow. He was headed because he was on the he show. He was going to be on the show. He was on the show. He was at the that. airport on the way there. They called him, and it actually worked out better for him because he made a lot more money in the beginning of his career because he was mm -hmm. able to negotiate for more money. But uh, but yeah, because you guys That's had the cool. most. You guys had it seemed like a lot of money back then, but you guys had not the best contracts coming out of that show. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty crazy, man. It was funny. Like <laughs> I was making no money back in the day, but it was like $1,500 a week. I'm like, you sign me up. Yeah. That sounds great to me. I was like, and I don't have to do anything. It wasn't until, you know, we had those cheesy, uh, what do you call it? Those challenges and stuff that we yeah. had to do. But those like, were bad. Yeah, they were pretty <laughs> bad. But like, You guys were carrying Barca loungers in, dude, in water. Yeah, it was crazy. We had log, like sawing logs, uh, carrying people on chairs. You know, there are all these nutty things. And then I think at a certain point, I don't know if it was like a a pivot that was planned or like, hey, actually, let's start getting these guys to fight. But like it wasn't exactly clear whether we were going to fight on the show until like at the end. Like I thought uh -huh. I think we all thought that it was going to be a bunch of challenges to weed out the week. And then whoever got to the finals, then we'd fight in the in the finale. But then. It was kind of switched. So that's why, you know, Dana gave that famous, do you want to be an effing fighter speech? Because a lot of people were like, wait a sec, we're just getting paid to be here. We're not getting Bobby paid to Suffer, fight. Baby. Bobby Suffer, baby. Yeah, Bobby so that Suffer. was the whole controversy <laughs> over that. So, yeah. But I mean, how lucky you guys that you guys had Bobby there because Bobby was the one with the – look, and I had Bobby in my gym at AKA. He yeah. was the mouth, man. He was the guy. Right. I mean, he didn't like something. He let you know. He was not shy and, no. you know, he'd been around, he was older. He was one of the older guys. You know, I consider him a mentor. He was really good about 
you know, not only knowing stuff like that outside of the sport, but, you know, um, the sport itself, like he yeah. was super helpful to me about like helping me along with my striking, which was abysmal back then <laughs> and, and all that stuff. So it, it was really, it was really cool to kind of just be able to train with all those guys who you know, every single person really on that show was more experienced than I did. So I just yeah. tried to soak in whatever knowledge I could. Well, Bobby owns an AKA American kickboxing Academy down in San Antonio in now in yeah. Texas. Yeah. He's yep. doing well. And, uh, he went from doing garage stuff out of his own garage, I believe. Now he yep. has his own little facility, but no, Bobby's been a walking book of knowledge for the longest time. I mean, uh, before we brought in Dave Camarillo, I was training with him mainly for my jujitsu because I mean, he was very talented. It was just very hard yeah. for me to do the, some of the, not hard. He, a lot of the bigger guy techniques weren't meant for us little guys. Right. You sure. know, like they were meant for us so we could do them, but like the game was different. We couldn't yeah. just heavy pressure and hold people down because, you know, us smaller guys were moving around like little mats underneath each totally. other. Totally. So, but man, he was, he was so helpful throughout my career, especially in the beginning portions of my UFC careers and stuff. He helped me a lot. So, and, yeah, uh, you know, we debate. had our bickers back and forth. I had my bickers with everyone in the gym, <laughs> believe it or not. I don't know if you, you guys believe Josh, that. Me? No. Nah, not at all. So, yeah. <laughs> but you know, he was, uh, he definitely was somebody that, um, we, we worked well off of each other for a while there, you know, and, uh, he ended up moving to San Antonio. Congratulations to him on his AKA gym there. Yeah. Doing well. But, uh, you know, you're in, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina now. North Carolina. Yeah, North in Carolina. Charlotte. I was yeah. actually in, I'm in Texas now. I left California, but cool. I was actually looking in that kind of in that area, Charlotte, but more kind of towards Raleigh, you know, in that area, yeah, yeah, there, in yeah. that Durham area there. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful nice up that well. way. Um, it really what, is. What kept you guys down in the Charlotte area? So, you know, I guess we had visited a couple places. It was mm -hmm. basically between Nashville and Charlotte. Um, Charlotte kind of reminded me of, of Boston a little bit, uh, to be honest. Uh, it was closer to family. Um, and, you know, it was a couple hours from the mountains, a couple hours from the ocean, yeah. which was really nice. And, uh, you know, kind of, we felt like we could replicate some of the stuff that we, we had in, in LA, mm -hmm. uh, when we were there, where we were close to both those things. And, you know, we, we liked, we like to go camping and, and see different things and, uh, be exposed to different things that the, the schools that my kids could go to were, were really nice here. And yeah, but I think more than anything else, it was just closer to family, you know, um, have, having kids, it's nice to have help out yeah. in LA. We had no help and yeah. people would have to travel a long time. So it was more, I guess, logistical than anything else. And, right. and, and we genuinely liked it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a pretty area. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. You know, when, when you're there, it's, is I'm very close because I'm in Tennessee. Exactly. I got to I got to see you in North Carolina because we were doing a little yep. uh a little thing doctor. for a for a documentary yeah. on mm -hmm. the Super first Ultimate doctor, Fighter, <laughs> all that good stuff. But Kenny, you, you know, you, you said something that kind of sparked something with me. Is you said I had really no experience. You didn't. <laughs> yeah. I'm being honest because you know yeah. your third fight was against Drew Fickett. Yes. and Drew Fickett is known as a guy. And at the time that you fought him, you had two fights. <laughs> Yep. And he had 24. <laughs> yeah. It's like, who was your there. manager? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They should be fired. Um, you know, I, I uh, th that kind of defined my whole career was basically being thrown into the fire and just being like, here you go, kid, try not to drown. And it was a blessing and a curse. Um, it was a curse because I clearly had a huge disadvantage. I was facing guys that had, significantly more experienced that are probably to be honest way better than me right and but it was a blessing in that i it forced me to have to learn very very quickly so instead of going against someone who was you know two and one or three and oh or two and oh um I, I can only gain so much experience from those type of people they're right where i'm at okay fine i'll learn something but when you're going against someone like that, you're going to take in that much more. Um, th there are painful lessons to take. I hated <laughs> losing, but at the same time, there you was didn't lose much. Yeah, well, yeah, hopefully. But, you know, but there was so much that I, I learned in that process of like things that I needed to improve on. You know, uh, the beautiful thing about the fight game is that your weaknesses will be exposed. You know, it's a truth teller, whether you like it or not. And you can ignore it, but it's going to expose itself yet again. And the key is, all right, what do I need to do to fix it? And with all these predators running around trying to beat you up, you're going to figure out ways that you are vulnerable. And, and the key for me was to like learn as quickly as possible. So, you know, it, that's what I mean. It's a blessing and a curse in that, you know, it did force me to learn a lot quicker, but you know, my record probably doesn't look as, as pristine as, as it could have, if I was taking the right fights at the right time. So it, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm being honest. <laughs> I, I know your record and 
okay, Drew Fickett is one of your like, – it was a split decision. I know that you yeah. lost. Yeah. But you only lost to world champions. You lost to Sean Shirk. Yep. You lost to BJ Penn. Mm -hmm. uh, Gray Jose Maynard, yeah. I think, yeah, and, Gray, Jose, and yep. Jose Aldo. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Out of all the people you fought, and you fought some studs. Uh, yeah, so they were good, man. <laughs> you had a hell of a career. Thank it you. Was, but it sure. wasn't – it was one of those things – uh, and this is what I, I was when I get to you retired from fighting actually back in like 2011, 12, 2011. You got it. You, yep. Yep. <clears throat> I mean, it, but you've been part of the sport because of the commentary and everything. So it doesn't seem like you've been gone that long because you're not that old. <laughs> what, you know, Josh talks about it all the time. He wishes he had more fights. You had 20 professional fights yeah. basically mm -hmm. in your career. Do you wish that you had fought more or no? I, I like exactly what I did. My farm needs the earth, the air, and the water. I get my energy going on Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. Clean, good tasting energy that feeds me like I feed my plants and animals. And after a long day on the tractor, when it's time to shoot the podcast, I drink Element so that I can stay energized and stay salty. Let's get it on. Yeah, so I went in with it knowing that I would I was going to stop fighting when it was basically one of two scenarios. Either um, I didn't enjoy it anymore or my body wouldn't allow me to do it. And that okay. was kind of the agreement. It was like if those one of those two things or both of those things happen, it's time to get out because this sport is just way too brutal to be in it for just the money or, or the fame or whatever the heck, you know, people do it for. Um, so. I, I really did it to accumulate skills and get better and see what I was made out of. And when my body started to fail me, when it was just like back injury after back injury, you know, frustration after frustration and dealing with all that stuff, I was like, yeah, that last one that, that I had after the Aldo fight, when I was uh, training, um, it was a back injury that put me out for way too long. And I just said, this, this isn't going to be feasible. And, and, you know, I was lucky enough also at the same time that I had an opportunity to do commentary and all that stuff. So, um, it kind of, it, I guess if there was a time for an injury to happen, that was going to stop me from competing at a high level. Um, it happened at a good time, I guess. And, and even then, like after that, I was like, well, maybe if I take enough time off, I could come back and, you know, get another fight. But, it, it was, it was, it was my time. Um, I didn't want to go in there against the elite guys and be at 60, 50, 40%. I, I'm not, I'm not physically as gifted as some of the other guys. I'm not, I'm not useless, but I'm not also not, you know, made of steel or, you know, just like muscly, quick, explosive, all that's especially at like 36 years old back then. I, I felt like I was getting better, but my body was kind of failing me and I didn't want to go in there with, you know, not enough. Totally did you, understandable. Did you yeah. see like a change? Not, I want to say a change of the guards, but did you see the level of the guys that were coming up? Did that kind of influence your decision as well? Not at all. You know, I, I felt like, you know, on a technical level, I felt like I was right there with the best. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, I certainly knew that it wasn't going to continue at 145 pounds. You know, that, that weight cut was just way too much for me. Um, you know, that I had a couple of really horrible experiences, uh, cutting down 145 pounds. But, um, for me, if, if I was getting better, I was going to continue to fight. And I felt like that was the case. And, and I think that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me what my favorite fight is. Eh, maybe I can give you kind of an answer, but more than anything else, I think I was, most proud that no matter what, win or lose, I was always a better fighter than I was the last time out. And and that to me was indicative of the hard work that I put in and, and the passion that I had. And um, and then if my body was like I had to put in more time than most people. That was the other thing it was like I knew that my biggest opponent was time. I started late. I started jiu-jitsu late. I started MMA late. Um, so I needed to be training all the time. I never took time off. I was training all the time. And if I wasn't able to do that, I would lose that advantage. You know, when it comes down to um, getting better at anything, it's like, how many hours are you putting in? All right, I'm going to try to do double whatever you're doing. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to be like stupid about it. I'm going to run my body into the ground, but mm -hmm. I'm going to find ways to try to do things more efficiently and 
um, just do more than that person. That's the only way you can kind of make up that time. Um, and, and again, like I, I started training at 19, 20 years old jujitsu. Um, I started to do I, my first MMA fight. I think it was at 28 years old. I was in the UFC like two years later, you know, so everything happened super, super quick. So I, you know, my, my learning curve had to be way faster than most people. Yeah. It's, sure. it's like, you've got to make sure that you're not overtraining your body. And there's a fine line between like, you're saying like, I got to do more because we want to get better. And you see that for me at the time of say, 20, you know, 2012, 2013, 14, sometime around there, I started noticing the younger guys that were coming in the gym. I'm like, these guys are good. These yeah. guys have been training. And then also too, you see guys like Rory McDonald. He started mm -hmm. off pretty much just training MMA. And he's, when he came onto the scene against Carlos Condor, everyone's was like, holy cow. Right. And that was kind of what we were seeing coming in in 2012, 20, 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. So I knew that my time was definitely, you know, coming to a close. For sure. And... <clears throat> I just wanted to know if you saw that same thing with the guys you train with the new talent that was coming in, you see around the gym or you see around the UFC guys that are training, you know, we would go into, into the training room sometimes you, you know, uh, before the fights and you'd be able to get some rounds in with people during fight week yeah. on the mats. Yeah. And you'd see these guys warming up. You see them rolling and training. You're like, wow, this guy's hitting the mitts, cracking the pads. You can hear him through the wall going, man, what, who's that? Mm -hmm. You know, um, like to me, that was a little bit more of, how I, I kind of started scheduling my exit out. Right. I wasn't sure if you started seeing that from some of these younger guys. Now, technically on the level, we could be there, but mm -hmm. the body doesn't do what these younger guys' bodies can do. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> you know, when, when I was healthy, I was fine. I didn't really have a problem with that. But um, yeah, when, when my back was going, like I, I can deal with other things, joint injuries and things like that, which I had mm -hmm. and staph infections, whatever I was dealing with, with training and fighting. But uh, apparently your back is kind of important <laughs> for moving in pain and uh, yeah. being hunched over. Like, you know, it, it would feel like someone stuck a kitchen knife in my back. Like I'd yeah. be hunched over in, and useless. I couldn't even like really walk or, or even sit down. So I was either needed to be like flat on my back or like not moving. So it was, yeah. it was one of those things where I'm like, all right, this is this is too much. Um, but I didn't I didn't mind the volume of training. I didn't mind going against younger guys. Like I, I still felt like I had, you know, the experience to be able to deal. I, I trained with Rory on a regular basis at TriStar and, and GSP and all those guys. So like it was fine. Um, but, uh, like the, the physical toll on my body, as far as injuries, uh, was too much when it came to the back. <clears throat> When, when you talk about your back and the injuries, did you end up having surgery to fix it or did you do it through physical therapy or what? I never did. I never did. Um, you know, I still deal with it. Uh, I, I never got the surgery. I haven't done stem cell. That's one thing I'm curious about. Um, so I, I have uh, two herniated Josh discs. Josh will set you up. Yeah, I have two herniated. <laughs> thank you. I have two herniated discs, bulging discs, uh, three annular tears, you know, mm. all in the low lumbar of my, of my back. And um, oh, so you're good. Yeah, exactly. I'm fine. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. So, you know, one thing that has helped definitely what is, um, you know, hip back and, and core activation and training and stuff like that. That's something I keep up. But even when I'm doing that, you know, if I travel, if I'm not sleeping in my bed, like yep. it's, it kills me, man, it's, it's really weird. And, and there's nothing I can really put my finger on of like what triggers what, um, for sure. You know, and this this is what was the hardest thing is even like doing jujitsu, like, you know, uh, does a number on my body. You know, yeah, jujitsu to me back, is is the one that does the is the worst on my back, especially yeah. if I'm on the bottom. I'm, I try yeah. not to ever be on bottom. Yeah, especially, to be when, on the top especially when position. you try to twist and turn those angles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's exactly what kind of gets me. So that and that's that's the thing I I enjoy the most, especially mm -hmm. in regards to like keeping in shape. Um, so now really I'm kind of restricted to just doing uh, strength conditioning stuff. Well, I just got back uh, last December through January. I was over in uh, Tijuana with CPI stem cells. Nice. Yeah. And so, you know, awesome. those guys over at OTM yes. right there, yes. Scotty, Scotty, those guys, I would yep. imagine you do. <laughs> so, yep. but uh, great guys, man, great facility. I know they're building out a new facility. And so that's all being done right now. They were nice. kind of halfway there when I was there, but uh, I'm, I, I can't say enough about them. They did my neck because... Uh, what was it? My S five, S six. I okay. couldn't, I couldn't even look up to the sky, man. And then within, I kid you not within like, stop. Seven, oh, stop. John can't because is. he's got a plate. He's got there a plate is. in his neck. 
<laughs> See, I was the smart yeah. one. It took the, it took the right there way. It is. I went the I'm right direction. Up. Well, that's the thing that worries me is, you know, I, I heard so many guys have the surgery and they're like, oh yeah, I'm feeling good. And then like two months later, I talked to them like, yep, I'm having the surgery again. Or, ah. you know, I had to get it again. Or, you know, it mm -hmm. don't really feel a huge difference. And for me, I just felt like, you know, the back is, is a little tricky where mm -hmm. I think about what are the risks that you're giving up, right? Anytime you go under, there's a risk. And then, you know, someone working on your spine, they screw one thing up and, yep. you know, I wake up paralyzed or something. So that scared the shit out of me. Um, but yeah, so stem cells seemed like a, a much better play for me. And uh, hopefully at some point I, I, get, I get the chance to go out there and, and, um, and, and look at the facility yeah, and, and get it done. I went out there and then uh, there was a girl that came out there. She was a female, probably in her like mid forties. She went out. There was two other ones that came with her too. They were doing the same procedure, uh, different areas of the low back. But um, nice. she she basically couldn't she couldn't sit down. She Gosh. she could she was using a rocker. Yeah. After she got done the next day, she actually walked out of there. She's like, I still wow. feel it, but I'm able to walk now. She was able to sit down. She wasn't able to sit down for like three or four weeks before that whole thing. So um, I can, I, like I said, for my neck, they put you under my, my concern was, you know, Columbia, they were offering me to go there. They were offering me to go to Panama city. I went with Scotty and those guys over there at CPI. And the reason being is because look, if like you said, if they're going to put you under and something does happen. They nick something. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I don't want my wife and my family <laughs> to have to fly me over here with, you know, with the yeah. expense of that. She could yeah. literally just drive across the border, pick me up, bring me back right. into the States. Right. So that was a major concern. If you're going to put me under, I don't know what you're going to do to my neck. So there was that. And then on top of it, I did my knee, my, uh, my hip and my wrist and all of them seem to be doing very well. My wrist That's is the awesome. one that didn't get the most benefit out of it <clears throat> because there's not a big, there's not a lot of tissue for the, the stem cells. After, to after the to. show, I'll tell you why his wrist is not good. Yeah. My wrist has been, you know, <laughs> it's been out for a while, it's been out for a while. So uh, but no, it's uh, I had you know, to. The, I knee, had. the knee and the hip, the knee and the hip feel good. The neck feels good. So of course, John always with the, you know, it's dig, quite the, the weight. Dig, it's quite the weight, you know. Yeah, well, it's, it, you is. Know, it, it is. is. It is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then both both my wrists would be out if it was that heavy. <laughs> so, but yeah, I can't say enough about those guys down there, man. It's a great place, and uh, they did a great job for me. So I'm gonna probably go back for my follow up here here shortly. But I'm looking forward to it, man. That's good to hear, man. I yeah, gotta, definitely. Gotta check it out. Look, like, yeah. you made you made the comment. You know what is your favorite fight? I'm gonna tell you the fight that I was most impressed okay. with you. And I, I did quite a few of your fights, and I always loved being in there with you because you were a very intelligent fighter. That's what made you so good. Thank you. But I wasn't the referee on this one. But your fight against Takanori Gomi. Oh, thanks, man. You just looked so good against a guy that it was. Still a phenomenal fighter. One time, the very best there was in the lightweight division. What is your idea of the, your best performance, your best fight? That that's definitely one of my favorites. You know that and the Clay Guida fight. I think just because Clay is such a such a tough Dog. guy to deal with. Yeah. Um, but the Gomi fight was a fight that I always wanted, and I always like you know dreamed of like being one of the guys from the UFC that they sent me over to Pride to, to compete against their their guy and. And Gomi was one of the guys that I always thought was like the scariest guy because he could wrestle yeah. and he's just knocking guys out. I remember when he knocked out Half Gracie, who, you know, I really loved as a competitor and all that stuff. And, um, you know, always wanted to face him. And I had the opportunity to face him first in the UFC um, and got to do it actually in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, of all places. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it went well. Like I, I didn't take any damage it was a clean performance i got a finish against him nope. and that was just a dream fight of mine that i always wanted um but uh yeah <clears throat> you know when i look at what i talk to Gomi came in and trained with us at aka for a while like a little mm -hmm. bit shortly before your uh shortly before your fight oh yeah okay and it was funny because i know that bob cook and i were buzzing about oh no you know he's gonna give Han kenny a handful he's gonna give kenny this problems da, da, da. then then i trained with him and i was like Kenny's going to take it. Kenny's going to take this because he just had, he had yeah. no answer for when you got him down. He had no right. answer. Yeah. I mean, like it was hard to get him down in the beginning, but then as, as we started sparring and doing more rounds, you realize he, he just never, he seemed like he threw everything with so much power that he tend to gas out, slow down. Yeah. And yeah. I wouldn't say gas out. It's more of, you know, how they slow down. Like then they're, totally. they become a little bit more predictable. You start seeing their shots, but yeah, I, I would say the same thing. Like, yeah, once, once we had seen him train and once I had trained with him myself, I was like, oh, Kenny's going to take this fight, no problem. Yeah, I think it, I, the fight I, had just got announced, too. 
Yeah, I think I think it's a lesson, right? Because like like John like John said, like he was the best in the world for like maybe five to seven years, you know, mm-hmm. considered anyway. And um, you know, if like you're not getting better, you're getting worse in the sport. Like people are getting better. All Everyone's the damn passing time. you by. Yep. Yeah, and if you're, you're catching not up. looking to get better, or if you think, hey, I'm good enough, or oh, I'm the yeah. best in the world, like it, it's a recipe for disaster. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're a business or a fighter or an athlete. People are gunning for you, man. And, and even worse, like when you're at the top of the world, like I, I know I'm watching all the best guys. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to figure out ways what they're doing. So the more that people get a crack at you, everyone's kind of trying to learn the blueprint as you go. And you know, it's like this cumulative effect of everyone kind of looking for successful strategies and figuring it out like that worked, that didn't, that didn't work. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take that. I'll extract that. And um, yeah, like people are going to figure out a way to beat you eventually. So when you take a look at guys like Habib, you take a look at like guys like BJ, who you fought, when you when you compare those two guys, do you put those two guys at the top of the 155 pound division, like ever in terms of goat wise, or who's on your list in that, in the, in the just in the lightweight division? Because I consider, and John gets irritated that I say this all the time, we we all have the, the best, time. Right, we have hands down the best weight class, hands yes. down we are the toughest, and yes, it's been the John, toughest. Don't deny it. Yes, don't hold deny on, it. hold on. There's only been two weight classes the UFC has ever really tried to get rid of, and yours is one of them. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> back in the day. People forget, like when I. That's why I couldn't fight at 155. I, yeah. The, after the there show, was I had none. to go to 170. There was no 155. There was no 100. People forget about that. Yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, I listen. I I think you're pretty spot on for who should be at the top of the list. You know, BJ Penn at in his prime was something else, man, because yep. he was so dynamic in both striking and jujitsu, and even wrestling. He was like he was a pain in the ass to get down. And <laughs> you know, I experienced that. You know, not that my wrestling was great or anything like that when I fought him, but like, you know, he was so damn talented and so dynamic. Uh, he was a finisher through and through, um, you know, when, when he was passionate and hungry, he was out there to kill you and he could do it in a variety of ways. <clears throat> so he has to be up there. And especially in regards to versatility, Habib was that guy who you knew exactly what he was going to do, but you couldn't stop it. And, and, yeah. and, and in some ways you could argue that's even more impressive because with BJ, you weren't sure exactly what you were going to get. There was, there was going to be some a level of chaos habib you knew exactly what was coming at you but he was a juggernaut um and he he did he wasn't um you know i don't i'm not sure he stuck around for as long as far as like fighting the elite for as long as he did yeah you know he he, he defended the belt a couple times and then he got out um but um still i don't know of anybody who has had that many fights who has remained defeated over the course of their yeah. career and was in the big organizations. It's just, that is unusual because as we all know, shit happens in training. Um, you know, stuff happens during a fight. You Not know, every night is your night. Yeah. You get a, you get a bum decision. You slip on a banana peel, whatever yeah. it is, you have a bad hair day. That could be the difference. Like, and for Habib to deal with all of those things and always get the result and come up with a W uh, is amazing. I think a lot of that had to do with the style and, and maybe I'm biased as, as a grappler, but you know, I think that if you are more of a striker, I think you're throwing the dice a little bit more than say someone with a, with a game plan of getting to a clinch and putting you on your back. Um, not to say it's not easy because it's not, it's extremely hard. It's just a smarter approach because there's less um, ability for, to have those kind of collisions where things could go wrong uh, in my opinion. So Habib's ability to clinch, get you down, keep you down, beat you up, um, was, was just unbelievable. And to do that, um, you know, in 2020, 2021 it is unbelievable because wrestlers, you know, really weren't that dominant until like decades before that. And to yeah. hit, see him bring that style back and to largely just be a wrestler. Cause in my opinion, from what I saw, and maybe, maybe you would know better than I would Josh, cause you saw him in training, but from what I saw, his striking wasn't wasn't anything to write home about. It's not like he had this amazing striking game. He he, he would like close his eyes and wing punches and stuff. And but it didn't matter because he was such a damn good grappler. You know, I did Shab's show and Shab had me on prop right when they announced the Habib and Connor fight. And I'm like, just watch. 
I go, his striking is way better than you guys think. I go, on top of that, though, I go, you just have to put it in perspective. When you're fighting a good wrestler, someone who's dominated in wrestling the way he did, it's going to make you hesitant to throw your punches. Totally. And look what happened. He yep. ends up dropping Connor. He ends up trying to finish him, you know, all those things. But that was because his wrestling was so dominant. If his but wrestling Josh, wasn't what it Josh, was. But Josh, you have to admit, when you, when you take a look at Habib, when he first came into the UFC oh, and gosh. look at some of his stand up. Yeah. What what he learned when he was at AKA in the stand up made him the fighter he was in 2021. Who was the guy that he yeah. fought, Habib fought, where they show a video of like, this is world class striking? And it's like him, I think it's like his second fight in the UFC. And he he's missing, out and throw, he's like missing every punch. <laughs> he's missing every punch. He's like jumping, trying to throw kicks oh, and turning yeah. his back. It was great. Yeah. It was great. But, but he made man, it work. He did the, the, the damn the guy made it work. The internet's undeceded. <laughs> it ah, it really yeah. is. You know, I mean, look at Drick is You know what I mean? Exactly. It's like it, it's yeah. it's ugly, but damn, yeah. he makes it, it work. Make it works, <laughs> doesn't you know? We we used to talk all the time about Keith Jardine, who you know yes. you, you knew and stuff. And Keith was one of the ugliest fighters as far as I'm not talking about, you know, his personal look, even though that wasn't too good either. You know, and I can say that <laughs> he's a movie I, star now. Just, what are you I, talking dude, he's, about? He's awesome. Man. I love, I love yeah. Keith, but he was, we used to call him Mr. Herky jerky because he yeah. had that, you know, and I saw fights that I knew that he won, that the judges went the other way based yeah. upon he's not yeah. fluid and it, it just looks odd and stuff. Yep. And it's not easy to get away with that. Habib actually got away from it a lot. He learned a lot in it. Yeah. And I tell Josh all the time, look at the most dominant fighter I ever saw in the cage was Habib. Yeah. Because he dominated good fighters almost every fight. He had moments he's just dominating a really someone we know is really good when they did know exactly what he wanted to do. Absolutely. And similar to Mayweather, it's like when you have trouble coming up with instances where if you can remember them being hurt in a fight, like, yeah, that's just, I don't know. Or, like lose, or losing up, a round. Right. Yeah. You, everyone brings up like the, oh, but Michael Johnson, when he he caught Habib, I went back and saw that. It was like, yeah. it didn't really do anything. Yeah. Like, yeah. Dude, I, I was, I was ref in the fight. Trust me. Yeah. He caught him. <laughs> He yeah, got a yeah. little wobble, and then he went right back after. It was fine, yeah. yeah. And it was like, that's the only thing I can really remember of him yeah. actually really taking damage like that. And that is remarkable, you know, and a testament to the training he had at AK. And, of course, his, his dad, his legendary dad of, like, yep. bringing him up since he was a kid. And these are the fighters that we're going to see more and more of. Like, you know, like, Habib was essentially born and bred to be a fighter. Yeah. He's been trained since he could walk, whether he liked it or not. I don't know if he had to be a pro fighter, but he had to learn how to fight. Yeah. And these are the kids that are coming up now, you know, who have either dads that are Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I mean, look at look at the kids in Jiu-Jitsu now and in oh. wrestling. It's insane. They're doing stuff that black belt adults can't do right now. They're rolling into back takes and, and all these crazy and things. They're You're stacked. Like, stacked. They're stacked. Just yeah, ripped. And there's other these kids, kids just like them. Yeah. Yeah, these yep. kids. Yeah. I mean, did, okay, that me now you brought that up about the kids in Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, Mikey uh, Musa Messi, Messi, yeah, he brought up that kids are sometimes at a young age, 10, 12 years old, already are on using steroids or performance right. enhancing. What now, I don't, yes, yes, who in the this hell is, is a parent is allowing their kid to take something that's gonna, it's gonna make their growth plates come together? Mm. That's the dumbest thing anyone could ever do. It's insane, and it's I think insane. that it, you know. Now that you're getting these kids that can get sponsorships and a lot of times it's their only way out, whether, you know, a lot of the kids are kind of coming from Brazil and getting sponsored by these academies. And a lot of times it's like they have to make it out. It's like when I went to Thailand, I'm training alongside these 11, 12 year old kids and that's their only way out in a lot of ways. Like they need to make money for themselves and their family and their gym or they don't eat. And you know, I don't know if it's that extreme for, for jujitsu necessarily, but like, yeah, the competitive nature is just getting out of hand. And you're seeing some of these parents that are like, well, we're going to send them to this gym and whatever they're doing, that's fine. You know, if uh, they're going to make them a champion, I don't care. And it's crazy because a lot of these kids are going to have major issues as they get older. It's like, all right, well, they'll win now, but let's see what happens to their body later or their brains, whatever it's going on. So. I, ju I just started a new podcast called The Dad Dojo, and uh, it's with uh, Bobby Lashley and another buddy of mine, Rich Chow. But we talk about basically influence, uh, what kind of influence you're going to have on your kids. Hmm. Are you going to hold them to the fire at eight, nine years old, you know, or 10, 11? Are you going to meet, like, are you taking no, the fun, fun out of the sport? I mean, you have two young kids now. I, mean, I don't know what their ages are in terms of like playing sports yet. Yeah. But 
there's times where you, like, I, I know when I'm watching mine, I'm like, man, it's a little frustrating, but yeah. it's more with the coaches. Like, <laughs> say, right. like say something, do something. Right. But I understand. But where are you at on this whole, like we were just talking about with the steroids in the in, for the youth at 10, 11 jitsus, and I get this their way out. But what's your take on just being a father? What's your take on the sports? And are you pushing it a little bit? Are you just being active with it? Are you trying to coach the teams? Are you just trying to be on the sideline watching them? What's your take on that? Yeah, you know, my kids are still young, so they're, they're kind of just starting that kind of journey a little bit. Um, you know, for me, I'm just kind of trying to be hands off, uh, which is difficult. Um, you know, I train with them, which is really just playing, you know, they'll come up and be like, daddy, can we wrestle? And we'll wrestle. So they're kind of doing it without even knowing that they're doing it. And I the try way to, to do it. This. Yeah, exactly. Like the Gracie's figured it out a while ago, you know? Yep. Um, and I think, you know, like playing, playing, which is something that us as adults don't do enough of. And I think like having that ability to be creative and have fun and, and learn, and then let them kind of uh, see how serious they want to take it. For me, the most important thing is giving 100%, whatever that is. And, and yeah. right now, they're still too young for me to be like, did you give it 100% yeah. today? <laughs> you know, but I do want them to, 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 to be able to defend themselves and do martial arts. If they want to compete, I really don't care. But whatever it is that they're doing, I want them to try to be the best that they can be at it. And... Um, you know, I'm not sure I really want them to fight, uh, but, um, I, I would love for them to learn about the, the millions of benefits that you get from doing martial arts and, and especially like one-on-one -on -one sports, what, whatever that is. Like there's so much, uh, about discipline and hard work and, and self-esteem and gaining that confidence and being like, if I can do this, that's really hard. I can do anything. And, and that's really the, the most important thing for me is like, having them walk through the world with that level of confidence and, and uh, knowing that they've experienced adversity in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And, uh, and that's something that could stay with them in, in all areas of their life. I feel like both uh, when kids play individual sports, it helps build their character, their confidence it, for them. They play yeah. a team sport, teaches them how to work in a group, teaches yes. them how to communicate. Cause you have to talk in a team sport. Hey, ball, ball, ball. Okay. Hey, yep. you know, and, and, and yo, their names, let them know you're going to be passing to them. Let yes. them know they, that's how you build relationships. That's yeah, how you work in skills and things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in your individual sport, that's, Hey, there's only one person to blame. That's you. Yep. Okay. You got to take responsibility for the technique that didn't work because you didn't drill it enough, or you just, you didn't shoot it properly or you just, whatever it was, you got to take responsibility for your losses, but you've also got to learn how to handle your wins. Can't be out there. Yeah. I smashed that kid. Oh, I'm better. I'm this, you, you've got to learn to humble and stay a little bit more yeah. humble. John. <laughs> John was that guy. Yeah. John was that guy. Uh, that's uh, why, that's why I'm the one guy here that didn't fight professionally. <laughs> But we got off we, we got off a little bit with uh, with the kids because I had to throw that in there real quick. But yeah. look, I asked John this the other day. I want to get your take on it. Yeah. Is the Gracie name is obviously very prominent just in the sport of the in, in MMA because they started the sport. They were yeah. one of the contributors of starting the sport. Habib's family name Nurmagomedov. Do you see what what is there a difference on who is whose name is going to be more? prominent as it goes on and is the Nurmagomedov name already past the Gracie name in terms of the sport I would say no not at this point but you know certainly for for the modern era I think it will be a family name that a lot of people will remember and and I think that you know the other thing we can't forget is that we stand on the shoulders of giants right yeah. and and you know a lot of people are like oh well I don't trade at a Gracie school anymore because you know there's more modern and there's more better there's more like <laughs> advanced schools and this okay well that may or may not be true whatever but none of us would be here without them right yeah. so it's like you need the people that are going to lay that foundation for us and um that is that is vital and and when it comes down to it you know like the fundamentals of grappling aren't changing. The techniques of grappling are changing. And that's what's supposed to happen. And I think that, um, you know, the, the Gracies have contributed to martial arts um, more than, I don't know, anybody in, in the last hundred years, I would argue. And um, I think they've made uh, fighting more effective. They've given us a completely different perspective and take on how to address one-on-one -on -one confrontation um, uh, efficiency of movement, uh, you know, uh, structural integrity when it comes to, you know, how you position your body and all that stuff. And, and I think that other people have 
learned from that wisdom and that knowledge and uh, improved upon it. And, and, and that's the goal. Like that's, that's what happens in engineering. Like, you know, a Ferrari from the sixties and a Ferrari from, no. you know, 2024, amazing car I'm just dropping, gla- dropping just, glass over you here. You just crashed your Ferrari. <laughs> I just <laughs> I smashed my it. whole thing. But you know, like, and that's just the way it is. Like things are going to get better and get improved upon. And the Magomedov family has certainly done that. Um, and I think they've made it better with, with regards to how they integrate their wrestling, you know, the, the Russian style of wrestling or the Dagestani, uh, style of wrestling. Um, you have guys like Buvar Star Saitiev that put Dagestan on the map with the, with, mm-hmm. you know, his wrestler, maybe the greatest wrestler of all time. And, you know, having that resource and integrating it into your Sambo and your judo and, you know, your striking and going out to AK and putting it all together. It really is a group effort, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. Um, it, that's where it gets a little tricky for me, but absolutely the Nirmaga Meta family will, will go down in history uh, for sure. Absolute legends. Bet US, America's favorite sports book and casino. Live betting and race book. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. I mean, because, yeah, you've got, you've got Umar making his run right now, and there's his brother, Usman, who's over in the PF, or in Bellator. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I don't know what he'll do in terms of sticking around over there. Well, um, the, only, the only difference is you have, like, Islam Makachev. Yep. Who is basically part of the Nermagomedov yeah. family. And we know people that are part of the Gracie family whose real last name is not Gracie, but they've incorporated Gracie yeah, into true. their last name and stuff. <laughs> so we're going to say now it's Islam Nermagomedov. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, basically. So, yeah. It absolutely. Is. But, but you kind of, you kind of were talking about it. The question you asked me on your show, mm-hmm. the Anakin Florian podcast yes. was, do you think in your prime, if you were to go back in your prime and you could, would the techniques be different? Could you hang in this industry right now, in this MMA world right now, with if you had time to to train for the techniques or whatever it was? Could yeah. you stay in this in this generation of fighting? It, it would be way more difficult, if I'm being honest. It would be way more difficult. Maybe not necessarily because the because of the technical stuff. Because you know, I was smart enough to know that I don't know everything, and yeah. I would always try to get people in that would help me. And, and that's what this is about. It's like. You know, anytime you encounter any type of resistance, any kind of, you know, adversity or challenge, it, it's about you to kind of figure it out. That necessarily wasn't the huge problem for me. But as we were talking about before, now we're getting these crazy athletes and, and now there's so much more knowledge on proper weight cutting and and training and guys that did start training when they were 10, 11, 12 years old. I, I didn't have that, you know, so that would have been a problem. and the maybe the biggest issue is the fact that for every Kenny Florian, like let's say back when I was fighting, there's like 30 of those guys, yeah, 40, 50. Yeah. And for every, you know, whoever it was, there's so many more of those guys. So now to make it to the top, you're going to have to face killer after killer. You're, there's no easy fights at this stage of the game. Like, and, and you go to 155 pound division, which we were talking about earlier, Josh, I mean, there's guys in the top 50 that would like murder guys back in the day. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Like it's just, it's such a deep, deep division. I yeah. think it's the deepest division uh, in the UFC right now. And um, you know, and some, some of the divisions aren't as strong, like 205 pound division. I don't think it's as strong. Yeah. I, the heavyweight division. More. Eh. Yeah. I feel I, like going 80, to, going to say the heavyweight right division now. again is what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, eh. yeah. yeah. It is. You know what I mean? So yeah. you've only got a couple of guys that you can look at and say, that guy is incredible. Yeah. In the heavyweight division. Aspinall is incredible. Obviously, John Jones had an incredible career. But when you get into number six, seven, it's like, eh, when you go into the bantam weights, featherweights, lightweights, you get into six, seven. Yes. Those guys are killers that could beat anyone on any given day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like 205, I think, is pretty weak. I mean, mm-hmm. really weak right now. Which is you know. what built this sport, to be honest, right? Yeah, no, From Frank Shamrock, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Liddell, Liddell, Red Peter Peter Ortiz. Jackson, Frank. Yeah, yeah. It was That's crazy. what built this sport was that, that, that division. That was their premier division. Yeah. Yeah. And then now it's it's there's nothing there. John uh-huh. left, but even John kind of wiped out the division two times over. Yeah. And you know, now he's awesome. Anyway. He's awesome oh, yeah. to oh, watch, amazing. but but he amazing. doesn't really have yeah. any competition. There's Uncle Liev, or which who I think they're kind of avoiding right now because of his wrestling skills, but like he doesn't wrestle a lot of, yeah i mean i don't know so we'll, we'll see what happens yeah. so you know, Dan, go ahead john i would say josh brought up your podcast with john, john anik yes 
you guys have had a special relationship for a long time based upon you working together in different platforms and everything. You've had over 500 shows. That's a, that's a lot of success. I want to congratulate you on that. What's it been like working with someone that is such a manipulative <laughs> and crazy <laughs> person like John? <laughs> I think is. Uh, Leave it to John. Look, look at me, John. Go just, with him, man. Come just on, stirring man. the pot over here. That's just... hilarious. We reference you often, Big John, because you know we, we do we do we do consider you like you know a huge authority when it comes to the sport and the rules and judging and all that stuff. But yeah, no, it's it's fun, man. You know, John is he is like he's the awesome. ultimate perfectionist. Yes, he's he is. Like he's hard on others, but he's clearly hard on himself. Like you yeah. know, you, he has this internal thing which everyone who's trying to be the best in the world like he has this chip on his shoulder where he constantly is is pushing and like it's something that strives him um it may break him one day but i do think it's one of those things uh and so he's yeah. always had that like, he's always been just the the hardest worker in the room he is extremely smart uh, he's constantly getting better he's also very very talented as well yep. and um you know like to see him go from where he came when we were at ESPN together to where he is now, where if we're walking around Vegas, you know, people are like, then no one knows who I am, which is great, yeah. but they will, they will, they will try to run to get to John. Like John is a superstar <laughs> now. It's crazy. Like he deserves this, it. It's, it's wild. Like, um, so the fans love him and, and, you know, he, he's definitely earned a lot of that popularity and, and to see the sport grow and to see him grow with it and now establish himself as really one of the faces of the sport mm -hmm. is extremely pr impressive and, and, and not surprising seeing where he came from and how much work he's put into it. So it's really cool, but yeah, like I, I miss working with him on, on, on the, uh, on the, on the broadcast desk, but to get a chance to work with him every week and really, I think what started is when we were working together there's only so much you could say as you guys know you know on the broadcast yeah. you know yeah. there's so much th stuff you want to be able to break down after the fight and discuss and go into detail on certain things and nerd out you only have like 15 30 seconds on a on a, yeah. on a desk or you know a dur during the broadcast to do that really uh post fight so we were like we were talking after the fight anyway like nerding out on it why don't we just do a podcast and john was the one who brought this to me and i was a little hesitant about it and we ended up doing it and um it's been a lot of fun man i can't believe we're we're way past 500 shows now john that's exactly how john and i kind of got our start too is we started working for bellator and we just started yeah. just chatting up after the fights we'd see no, we started pictures. drinking yeah, we started drinking. We started drinking. We'd be at the bar, you know, with a beer. We'd have a beer or two, yeah. or three or four, right. you know, maybe five or six. We'd be but sitting we, at a table. All of a sudden, we realize hey, everyone's gone, man. Everyone's gone. They've <laughs> closed down. Exactly. And just be the two of us, and sometimes, you know, a third or fourth person be with us. But we're just shooting the tra uh, the, the shit over over it. Yeah, over and fight. it just led to like, hey, you know what? Let's just let's just do a podcast. See how it turns out. If it turns out right. well, and then COVID hit and it blew up, you know, during COVID, yes. so that helped us a lot. But it's awesome. Have man. You, you guys are doing it? Not to take a dig at Anik, and I'm not. Yeah. This is not a dig. This is about yeah. play by play people. Have you noticed though that they're a little bit stranger than the rest of the people? Like they they <laughs> tend to they they tend like you said perfectionists. They they've got their stuff just nailed down. I mean, I've worked alongside a lot of you know from Goldie to uh, Moro to you know to to it just you see and you just can tell they're. They're a little, they're a little they're built different. Like, they're built, they're built just different. Like, just there like you fighters. Go. You know, it's yeah. like for us, we think we're normal, but most people are looking we're at us not. like, how do these guys do? Like these guys are not normal. No. Right. So like, I, I think that first of all, they they probably like, uh, they like like fast paced stuff. They oh. need to be able, like, they love like having the ball and being able to like dish it out. Right. Yep. And being able to micromanage all these different things because they're getting fed through their ear. They have to deal with one, at least one or two other people on the broadcast. Dude, at all the times. job they do is not easy. They, no. they have to read these, you know, commercials at really awkward times, and yep. you know, people think like, "Why did he say it at that time?" It's like because he had to had say to. it. At that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, so it's there's, there's so someone much... in the ear telling them now, now, now. Right. Well, it's like a fighter pilot. Like you know, yeah. like you, there's only so many people that can do it, and I think it's the same way with uh, play by play. It's there's yeah. only so many people that can do that job and manage all those little things and do it well and make and it John look so easy like that yeah and make it look yeah. so easy that's uh, an art yeah, yeah.
Uh, you know, I, I, we had Dean Thomas on uh, yesterday and Jens Pulver on yesterday, which those shows will be releasing here shortly. I think Dean Lee actually dropped this morning. Uh, Jens will be dropping shortly as well. But I asked them the same question I want to ask you is, when did you know it was time to retire? And when you take a look at guys right now that are in the sport, and I, and we talked to Anik about it, we got a lot of love. Even though I fought him and I lost to him, I've got a lot of love for Tony Ferguson. Maybe he doesn't feel the same way, and it doesn't yep. bother me. Sure. But there's guys in the in this sport that I look and I go, man, it's time. And maybe you're doing it for your own reasons, whether you just the money, whether it's you, you have something still to prove to yourself. I don't know what it is. But when did you know it was your time? That was one and two is. What's your thoughts on the guys that are sticking around too long? Yeah, you know, for me, it was pretty easy. We, we touched on it, you know, just with the back injury. and But I felt like when I couldn't get back to where I wanted to physically, I knew it was time. The guys were just getting, you know, too good. And I wasn't going to, um, you know, leave myself vulnerable to, to something like that. Uh, the sport's too brutal. I was lucky enough that it didn't take a whole lot of damage. And, and you know, I promised myself that I wasn't going to do that. And, yeah. and you know hey, if I'm being honest, maybe I would have had to if I didn't have other opportunities too. Maybe if I wasn't smart with my money, maybe if I didn't have other things going on, I would have had to do it, right? So, uh, you know, so that's the other aspect of it. So there's the financial stuff where guys are like, this is all I know. I got to pay bills, you know, whether, whether it's they have kids or they weren't too great with their money, they haven't been able to put it away or, or they just, they're just playing catch up. I mean, between inflation and everything else that's going on right now, it's not easy uh, to go out there and just, you know, take care of business saying like you could, you know, paying bills and all the other stuff that goes along with it, especially if you have a family. So um, it's hard. I, I, I think that for us as fighters, you know, talk about being, you know, built different or, or thinking differently. We forget that, you know, we we're we're not going to be able to do this forever and our bodies aren't going to feel like this forever and you know we have one brain we we have one body and i think in a lot of ways we need to think that we're invincible uh, the reality is is that we're not and, yeah. and i've seen a lot of examples of fighters that just clearly aren't the same of what they were before um you know either based on their speech or their memory or their abil- ability to even move and walk and you know so it's sad to see, man. Uh, this sport takes its toll on you. Uh, football is the same. Uh, a lot of yeah. these other sports, the boxing, right? Any of the combat sports. And um, but so I think that w- when your body is starting to get broken down, when you're starting to experience knockout after knockout, what you need to be able to avoid is a- any kind of CTE implications. And um, but of course, there is the other component of it, which is, you know, your, your financial incentives and, and what you got going on to be able to yeah. make money for your family. And a lot of people, this is all they can do. Um, so it's, it, it's tricky, man. You know, I, when we started this podcast, I just wanted to kind of touch on something real quick is that I had this idea that fighters are going to struggle when they get done fighting. And majority of them are going to try to do what we're doing right now by starting a podcast, which is great. What I, what I think that where I feel like the fighters could all work together in this situation, which is very rare for fighters to do because it's, all, it's only been about them their whole career, is if you see fighters that are starting a new podcast, you see fighters that are, are out there just you know trying to get theirs off the ground, you've got you've to kind of join and reach out to them. And I've reached out to several that have started their shows, hmm. no response, crickets. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, look, I'm only here to help you. I'm not trying to do anything else but help you. And I've, I've got that really when I did Rogan's podcast and talking about like, we're all here to help, man. This is a small community. I'm not fighting you anymore. There's no yeah. chance I'm ever going to fight you. The, the career's over. Let's talk about it. Let's help you guys. Let's help you guys grow. I try to pump everyone's podcast as much as I possibly can, you know, and like I did with Bobby's show right now, like, or not his show, but his gym. Like it's any chance you have someone in the past that you know that is doing something new outside of fighting, man, I'm trying to pump that. I'm trying to let them know that, man, this is a big deal. You're doing something different besides going to your nine to five at the gym every day, you know? And, yeah. and I said on Rogan's pocket, your old life is going to, your new life is going to cost you your old one. You have to get rid of going to the gym three times a day. If you yeah. want to start something new, you want to be something new. You have to get rid of that old job. You can't just show up. I caught myself. 
I don't know if you did this after you were retired or after your last fight. It was, you were basically saying like you, did you go to the gym still every day after you were done? Uh, no, no, I, I caught go every see, day. No, I caught, I caught myself going, yeah. you know, every day, like as if I was still fighting. And then I finally, like probably about a month after I kept doing it every day, I'm like, what am I here for? I know <laughs> yeah. I'm not fighting. I hadn't announced my retirement yet, but I knew yeah. I was done. I'm like, I don't, right. I don't feel this anymore. So having, having more fighters on, giving them a platform to, to pump whatever it is they're doing, their gym, their podcasts, their new ideas that they're trying to work on, man, I, that's all I can do is I can think about just trying to help them as much as possible to give them a platform to speak on. No, absolutely. I think that's, that's awesome, man. And, and I think that, you know, not trying to be so dramatic, but I think there, there's definitely some parallels there is like, it's kind of like being institutionalized, you know, like yeah. the people in prison, they, they got to go back to prison because that's yeah. all they know. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like, man, that was the hardest thing for me saying goodbye. It was like, it wasn't necessarily like announcing retirement. It was me saying goodbye to a piece of myself that knew that Monday, I didn't even know it was Monday. I just knew it was strength and conditioning yeah. and striking and jujitsu day. That's what it was. And then Tuesday was another day like of training. And, and I just had this great schedule and this is what I was doing Monday through Saturday. Sunday was my day off. And, um, it was this like beautiful simplicity. That's what I was doing. And I'd done it for so long and saying goodbye to that and not knowing yeah. what I was going to do and having all this time. It was like, shit, I, I got to figure something out. Like the, the, it was, it wasn't as satisfying to me as well. And I think for, you know, a lot of these fighters knowing what they're going to do after or setting themselves up for it, it's really hard for them to start to even think about that stuff. You know, I, it, it is, but I, I try to tell them all, look, I want you to take a look at what you've done with your career because, you know, and, and I say, you know, one thing that the MMA has, it has a lot of college graduates, which is great. And that comes a lot from the wrestling and everything. But every fighter that has attained to that level that you guys have, you got a PhD. Okay. It, it may not be from a university, but trust me, you got a PhD and yeah. it took you an incredible amount of work and effort and drive to get to that. And if you've done it once, mm -hmm. put that same amount of effort or whatever it is that you want to do, you put that same type of drive and effort and focus, you'll be a success. Mm -hmm. You will be, but you got to do it. And you got to get rid of, like what Josh said, you got to get rid of the past yep. to start implementing the future. And so it's a tough thing, but I'm going to off of that you you have not only done MMA and you were with the PFL for a little bit and stuff we talked about that when we were in North Carolina mm -hmm. but battle bots how in the <laughs> hell did you start being the guy that talked about robots killing each other dude <laughs> you know, uh, John, I, honestly, I would love to say that I had this master plan and I was okay. I had it all figured out and I I'm sure you did to be able to do it, but I did not. I wish I did. <laughs> um, you know, I, I honestly, I, I just kind of like would plug away at stuff and, and opportunities would kind of fall into my lap, you know? Um, and I, I feel very grateful that I've had a lot of these opportunities and it was one of those things that just kind of was presented to me. Hey, would you like to come out and try out for the show? And Living in LA, it's like everybody's got some kind of like show or thing oh, yeah. or project. Oh, I got, oh, I got a pilot. This project. Yeah, I got this I pilot. I went, you got to come out and read for the. And I was just like, uh, yeah, whatever. It's this here is another thing that someone's and it's just not, never yeah. going to come to fruition. Yeah. And they said, no, no, listen, we want you to come out for an interview. And I was like, all right, well, I'm in Northern California right now. I'm driving back with my wife, you know, okay, you know, if I get there. You're like, we, we're pretty sure we have who we're going to pick, but if you can just come in for a last minute interview, okay, whatever. Oh, we're I pretty sure pretty we have you, but you want me to come in. Thank you very <laughs> exactly. much. Exactly. That's why I was like, yeah. I came in with like, there's no way this is going to happen. So it almost helped me because I was just very relaxed in myself yeah. and um, went for an interview and they're like, we'll let you know. And I wasn't exactly sure which direction they were going to say. They're like, either we're going with like an engineer slash past robot builder or we're going to go like the fight announcer route someone like we're going to try to build this up as a fight as opposed to like mm. engineering right it's a fight yeah and they went the fighting route yeah. and geez 48 <laughs> hours later they couriered this packet which was like that thick of all these robots the history of the sport and I immediately, I was so excited that I got the job, but then I looked at this and I got so much anxiety because I was like, <laughs> wait a sec, I don't, I don't know, know this sport. I don't know what no. I'm doing. I don't know what I'm talking about. I get to memorize 
like an encyclopedia book of stuff. Like I am not ready. And it was going to be on ABC. And, oh. and I was like, this is by far the biggest thing I've ever done. Like, oh my, what did I do? What did I do? I'm going to look like an idiot. I'm working with Chris Rose and you know, all this. And anyways, I, I, I just, it was again, talk about Kenny Florian being thrown into the fire again. And, and I had to, you know, <laughs> force right. myself to learn as quickly as possible. And, and it worked out well. We we've done eight seasons so far. Wow. We're hoping on doing uh, another one. Like it's become a huge family show and it's hilarious. Like one of my proudest moments was when uh, someone uh, sent a tweet to me. This was a few, when it was still called Twitter. Uh, they said, uh, why, why is the BattleBots guy talking about fighting right now? And I was like, this is great. This is the yes. best thing ever. I'm the, I'm the BattleBots guy talking yeah. about fighting. It's hilarious. So, That's perfect. awesome. Yeah, man. it's pretty fun. Dude, I, I'm being honest. I've watched it, you know, several times. Okay, and, okay, yeah. And you're awesome. No, it's <laughs> funny you, because you get, you know, you make it like, oh, look at yeah. that. And it's, it's, well, it's a like lot. A, of... It's like a McKinn again. It's a, a yeah. bunch of little car accidents happening over and over. And well, there's over a lot again. of there's a lot of little car accidents. <laughs> well, yeah, going yeah. I'll tell you what. Some of those damn things are engineering marvels. It's crazy. It's People crazy, are... John. Good. So these things weigh 250 pounds. So there's a weight limit, right? Just oh, wow. like a heavyweight division. It's 250 pounds, up to 250 pounds, not a, not an ounce more. And uh, and you know they have like weights on how much the can weapon they drain can... oil for a weight cut? Yeah, pretty much, pretty <laughs> much, right? So they'll have this bar that weighs eighty pounds. So you think about a forty-five pound bar like on the bench, mm -hmm. right? So you have this eighty-pound bar that can spin up to two hundred and fifty miles an hour. Jesus. And 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 they're made out of AR steel. You think about anyone who's shot before? So these that's that level of steel, yeah. that hardness of steel, hardness. and and they're spinning at each other, just colliding into each other at these insane speeds. And it's just like survival of the fittest. And uh, it's pretty wild, man. It's pretty wild. <laughs> well, yeah. it's funny because they they gained me by watching them. I was just flipping through the channels and I heard your voice. And I was like, that sounds like Kenny. <laughs> that was, was exactly like, that sounds how like, I did it. And I, I know that annoying I, voice. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I was like, <laughs> wait. I, I had to watch because I didn't see your face at the time. I was like trying yeah, yeah, yeah. to. I had to wait. I was like, that's it. That's Kenny. I know that's that voice. Kenny. It's got to be Kenny. <laughs> I know that voice. And then I saw your face. I was like, good. I'm not going insane. CD <laughs> didn't get me. You know, that's I was hilarious. like, oh, man. Yeah, man. Hey, I got I got one. I actually got two more, but one more uh, question for you. this one's more of a question. The last one's more of just to pick fun at you. Mm -hmm. But cl the the class action lawsuit. You're in that that frame. Yes. Um. Your what? Your last fight was 2011, right? 2011. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in that frame. It's 2010. I think is when they started it. Yeah. I, th I think I have two fights during that time. Two period fights here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have you, what's your take on it? What's the, what's the, uh, just give me your thoughts. I don't want yeah. to sit here and say like, hey, sure. Anyway. Yeah, no, I think that, um, you know, I, I imagine that nobody wants to go to court and drag this out. I would think that they're either working on it or close to some kind of, uh, an agreement. Um, you know, clearly the judge, uh, didn't like the lawsuit. He felt that it wasn't fair to the fighters. Um, and the, I assume they'll probably look for a, a larger settlement. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, again, these are very expensive things. Yeah. I think that I've heard both sides of the argument that, you know, listen, it's going to be very hard uh, to win a unanimous, um, you know, uh, decision in, that, in, in that, court. That's my, that's my take. You're in yeah. trouble. It's going to be very difficult. Um, but you could also argue the, the risk for them to go to court. Sure. You know, they, they could treble the damages and now they're in for billions. So mm -hmm. that could be tricky. And then if they do end up, if the, if the fighters do end up winning uh, the lawsuit, then the UFC always has the, the ability to just continually appeal the decision and push it back and back and back and just, you know, have it become this uh, war of attrition. So mm -hmm. the, the, it, it comes down to, you know, anytime things go into the courts and you have lawyers involved, it just gets very, very messy. Um, you know, I think that in the end, I, I think what the fighters are looking for um, are some kind of changes uh, to contracts to make it more fair and um, to get whatever money, you know, they felt, they feel that the, the market, um, uh, should have been giving them originally. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, you know, I think, and I think that if, if some kind of agreement is going to be made just based on like timelines and things like that, that need to happen before we actually need to go to court. Mm -hmm. I, I think if some kind of settlement would need to be approved, I think by October or something like that. Yeah. So I, I I'd expect something kind of down the pipeline pretty quickly, but who knows, man, like, 
this is this is above my pay grade. So do you, uh, do you feel like you were owed some more money? The re- the reason why I'm at, yeah. I don't want I, the reason why I'm saying this is because I know that when my when I won the title, I was up for renegotiation renegotiation with Strike Force. And we put some feelers out to the UFC and the UFC told us kind of, I'd got some ideas on what the money was going to be like. And it wasn't what I was making in strike force. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't willing to go ahead and leave to the UFC because that, that time backroom bonuses for you guys were like 25, 50, sometimes more depending yeah. on, you know, but it definitely wasn't the million dollar ones they're getting now. I can tell you that, mm-hmm. but those conversations, um, you know, I said, I can't bank my career based on that. And I knew you were one of the yeah. top guys. I believe around that time you fought BJ, you fought, you know, a, a lot of the top, you were fighting guys at 2008, you were fighting BJ. Yeah. And so that was title fights. Those were the, just seeing what you guys, understanding what you guys were making and what I was making over at Strike Force. I, that's why I didn't leave. I stayed. Yeah. And so I do understand where people are coming from, but do you, what's your, do you feel like we could have, we should have been making more in the market was what it was or? Yeah. So I'll say this. I think that for me, I felt like I was finally getting paid much better. I I felt like I was pretty satisfied at the end of my career. Um, In the beginning, I I probably wasn't, you know, I was coming off the ultimate fighter contract, all that stuff. So, um, but then I also knew that I needed to prove myself that I did deserve that. And, and, um, and the sport was still kind of being built up at that time. So, you know, um, the one, the one time that I felt like I should, like I got a big bonus after the BJ Penn fight, which was awesome. You know, more money that I'd ever seen and and all that stuff. And then, um, when I fought Jose Aldo, I I felt like, uh, you know, I didn't get any bonus at all. Mm. And that was one of the things where I was like, based on what I did to travel around and help promote the fight and all that stuff. And I didn't think it was the best fight, but I almost died making weight. And given what I got paid for that fight, that was one where I was, I was really disappointed with that mm. one. Um, and, and if you looked at like, you know, win bonus or like fight bonus and win bonus, it was like, oh, I was pretty good for the time, yeah. but I still felt like I should have got more than that. I did, I got no bonus whatsoever for that. Yeah. Um, and that was a championship fight. And, um, but so that, that was disappointing to me. Um, and I also felt like, you know, it was a, you know, we had the opportunity to make money, you know, maybe not as much as now, but, um, yeah, I, I felt like it wasn't like those things were being denied to me. The opportunities mm-hmm. were there to be able to do it. And I just kind of had to go out and do it. So I knew I was making more money than a lot of other people, you That's know, true. but I do think the sport is in a completely different, uh, That's stratosphere true. now. And yeah, I'm just curious to see, you know, what happens with the lawsuit and which way they're going to go. And, and hopefully it just ends up becoming better for the fighters. It sounds like, um, fighters are getting paid more. There's more opportunities for it, but, um, I'm sure there's a long, a long way to go. You know, if you, if you compare it to other sports, um, you know, it seems like there is a disparity there and, and, um, curious to see how things evolve. Do you think they'll ever get a fighters association? Probably not. I just don't see fighters joining together, right? Like teams can yeah. join together. Be like, if you take two or three teams out and be like, no, we're not going to stand together. Right. Then you're, they're screwed. But you take fighters. There's always someone that could come in and like, I'll do it for cheaper. And exactly. I give- like hundred percent. You like, first of all, I think that there's, there's too much, too, too many fighters that are looking for that opportunity. Yeah. Um, you can replace an individual. You can't necessarily re- replace a team. And um, it's hard when you also have those big disparities on who's getting paid for what, you know, mm-hmm. it's like John Jones is making tens of millions and you get another guy who's making, mm-hmm. you know, 10,000. Um, they're, they're just not going to the meet in the middle that way. And, and everyone kind of be in for each other, you know, I mean, maybe after some people retire, but yeah, I just don't see it happening just based on the fact that it's going to be difficult for, for everybody to, to really come together and go, okay, we're, we're going to lock out. And, and no one's going to fight for 12 months or 16 yeah. months. Or whatever, I mean, you know, so. I really believe it's going to take a couple of the champions because that being said, ESPN has deals saying with the UFC that they need to have championship fights. So if, they, if four or five of the champions say, Hey, we're not fighting now, they can't put championship fights on. Mm-hmm. And so that's where you, that's where they can maybe get them to, to start talking about an increase. Yeah. 
Euro but those are the guys increase. that are getting paid. Those are the guys that are getting paid the most. They're exactly. Gonna go, I'm not going to say no to five million, two million. I get, but, you know, I so. get what you're saying, and yeah. that's where the hard part is. But I mean, saying it's going to yeah. take that though for it to happen. If and it's like, to happen. and it's easy for the UFC to say, okay, we're going to have an interim title. It's a championship fight. Right. That's not a championship fight. You know that. Stuff. Yeah, I'm just telling you, <laughs> Kenny. I'm going to I'm going to talk about championship fights here, and this may be a mean question. Yeah. But you had three title fights. You had Sean Shirk. You fought BJ Penn. And then Jose Aldo. Yep. You never got that chance to put that belt around your waist, but you are considered by a lot of people when talking about the guy that never won the championship. Your name always comes up as one of the guys that, you know what? He were right there and people look and say, could have been just depending upon who he was fighting at the time. It was just not enough. Does that bother you in any way? Do you look back and 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 say, "Yeah, I didn't I didn't fulfill what I wanted?" Or are you at peace with exactly how things came about and what's meant to be is meant to be? Yeah, I I think that um hard question, I know. I'm yeah, sorry. no. Well, I think you know, in a lot of ways I I can look at it and go, "Well, you know, the, the, the world doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, maybe that's what I needed. Um, and I also think that like, you know, th there are a lot of different factors to that, you know, um, you know, some bad luck, some bad training, some bad experiences. Um, and not everybody can can get to the top of the podium, unfortunately. And uh, for me, I guess it, it goes back and forth. You know, I, I'm an extremely competitive person. Um, that's why I work so hard was I didn't, I didn't work so hard to become, you know, uh, the best guy to never win. <laughs> I tried to be the guy that won. Of course. And, um, and so that hurt, you know, that hurt for a long time. Um, but looking back, you know, I'm for where, from where I like started in the sport, um, to, you know, what I had to learn. Um, I'm, I'm proud of like where I came from and how far I went, I guess, you know, especially given the fact that like coming off the ultimate fighter, or, you know, like no one really gave me a chance to do anything and, uh, to, to have those improvements and to be able to like kill myself to make weight. I proved a lot of, a lot of things to myself that, um, that I wasn't exactly sure I was capable of doing before I started on this journey. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, my last thing for you is, you know, you said being on the top of the podium and uh, those Patriots were at the top of the podium for two decades. <laughs> they were. Now it's, it's my Chiefs her, turn, her. baby. It's no, her, it's now her, it's yeah. my Chiefs yeah. turn. I'm a Chiefs guy. I got to go, Chiefs guys. Guy. I don't blame you. <laughs> I got I gotta put up with this crap all the oh time my now. God. Let's oh. go, baby. Let's go. Uh, but <laughs> You guys are killing it, man. How I, difficult I, is it I to have to build that trade face. Patrick Mahomes? How difficult. See how good they are now. Let's see how good they are now. Exactly. How difficult is it to go through the build back phase? Oh um, gosh, it's t it's different, right? It's yeah. different. I, I think they have a good coach right now. I they think do. Mayo's Mayo's a good coach, man. So I'm curious to see how they evolve. They were really close last week, you know, in a good game against Seattle. It kind of blew it, but um, but yeah, it's I, I would definitely think that's a fair assessment that we're kind of building back, mm -hmm. uh, trying trying to get things better. You know, offensively, I think we're going to struggle for a little bit. Um, you know, there's obviously the development of the new, new quarterback and, um, he's trying to l learn the ropes right now, but, um, I think probably we're on a two or three year plan right now, but <laughs> we, we had, a, we had a really yeah, good did. run, man. We had a really good run. So for me to kind of go into anything else, people are going to start hating on me, uh, we, we had a good run, especially in Boston, man. All the teams. We, we Everybody won. wants to see you guys suffer for the next couple of years. They're like, Boston, Massachusetts, get that well, out of here. That's the other thing, right? It's like Champions Town, yeah. except for me. I wasn't able to get it done in MMA. So uh, thank you, John, for reminding I'm me. Right. I'm bringing it in. It is one of those that you take a look at. And, man, the guys that you fought, BJ yeah. Penn's of the world, Jose Alda, both at the top of their game when you fought them, and you were that close. Damn. I remember the one thing with Sean Shirk is you would cut him open. Yeah, and you and you said that was the worst thing that you it ever was the did. Worst thing. <laughs> it bled all over me. What right. funny thing about that is, I remember waking up the next morning, and I I had showered after the fight. I went back to my hotel room and showered, and the next morning I was grabbing my stuff to you know get on the plane. I kind of like had a little scratch in my ear, and all this dry blood just kind of came <laughs> on the inside of my ear, and it was Sean Shirk's. And you're I, just, just I like, carrying uh, Sean Shirk around with you. Yeah, yeah I could <laughs> never not get that smell and taste of his blood uh, out of my mouth which is disgusting so anyway yeah. maybe we'll end on that <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you brother, i want to tell you kenny 
Thank you for everything you've done in the sport. 185 pound down to 145 pound and went for all those weight classes. You are an absolute gentleman throughout all of your fights. You're a great ambassador of the sport. You've been an incredible announcer and you are an incredible podcaster also, even though I can't sit there and say that you're number one because I got to take that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on here. You are the man. We appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank the legendary so Kenny Florian. You guys are the best. Thank you. Thanks, brother.